Ephesians chapter 2, we are going to be specifically looking at verses 4 through 7, but I'm going to read 1 through 7, because as in real estate, location, 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 in studying the Bible, context, 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 uh, we want to know what this is saying, and in truth, it's the whole book, but right now, we'll read chapter 2, 1 through verse 7, but we'll specifically look at 4 through 7. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you would release your heart, that you would put Jesus on display in a very personal way, that we would know the glory of God through the Holy Spirit presenting to us the beauty of Jesus. God, I pray for specific situations in here that I don't know. I pray into the pain and the anguish that people are coming in with. I pray into the questions and the confusion that people have. Um, I pray specifically into the fear of those who wonder if they really have faith this morning. God, I pray into the exhaustion of people trying to fix things themselves. Father, show us what kind of God you are. Show us your love. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So today's Palm Sunday which tons of you are like, I don't even know what that means. And some of you are like feeling guilty. Should I know what Palm Sunday is? But Palm Sunday is an actual event that took place that's recorded in the Gospels when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and there's all of these Jews there with palm branches and they're waving the palm branches as Jesus rides through on this donkey and they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, you don't understand this moment unless you understand history. Um, Years and years and years before, the Jews had been under an oppressive regime and they were let out. This is what led to Hanukkah, actually. But they were let out, ultimately, um, behind a liberator named Joseph Maccabees. And when he was riding through, they took palm branches and were saying, Hosanna, which is, hooray, there's a deliverer. We've been delivered. Well, now they're under Roman oppression And they're hoping for deliverance again. And they're waving the flags, hoping that what they've heard about Jesus, that he's the deliverer they want. Because, listen to this, they're experiencing real things, a real lack of freedom, both collectively as a people and individually. Their families are, they are as a people. They're experiencing a lack of freedom and they want to be free. Therefore, they're experiencing a lack of life. They're living a life that feels more like death, like they're dead people walking. And they know right now they need a deliverer. So when they're waving the branches, they're waving the branches of help. They're waving the branches of expectation. Is this it? And here's the reality of Palm Sunday. Every person in this room regardless if you believe the things of the Bible or you don't, we're all waving our own palm branches, metaphorically speaking. We all have things in our individual life that we want freedom from. We all have things in our individual life that we want to be different. We all have things in our lives around us that we want to be different. We're all experiencing in ways that we wish weren't so a lot of our life that feels more like death. Whatever words you'd place to that, Anxiety, depression, exhaustion, experiencing hatred, hating others, whatever it might be that looks, we look at the world around us and we go, it's a mess. 
or even in the quiet of our own cars or when we honestly face ourselves in the mirror and we know it's even deep within us. We're waving the branches. And we're waving the branches because what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 at the very beginning, that we live in a world of death. Look at what he says at the beginning that Tim taught last week specifically. Paul says this, and you, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now what he does in covering that we are dead in sin and death is in the world because of sin, he applies to Jews and Gentiles alike. He's saying all of us, all of us also lived among These death works is the way one uh, author puts it. My life amongst the death works. These death works. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler, the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, everybody, that was true then and it's true now. I don't care what your worldview is, what your political opinion is, what your economic status is, what your ethnicity is, the culture that you were raised in. All of us is all of us. We all have the word is solidarity, unity in sin. And sin is the thing that makes the world, that makes the world like, why is it so weighty? Why is it so hard? The reality that as you get older, you feel it more. You feel it more in your body and your eyes open up to the reality of it in the world world, and it feels like an onslaught of, can I just hide from this? No, and what Paul's saying is it's like that because it's in you. It's like that out there because it's in you. And he's defining this for the church. Remember, Ephesians is written to a church. So he's saying, if you think you're off the hook, if you have now become the experts because you're the people who get God's ways, that you're constantly pointing your finger at everybody else in the world and going, that's the problem. He's going, no, the problem's in you. Sin is in you. We all have solidarity in sin. I like to say it like this. If sin were blue, we'd all be Smurfs. I actually like this picture. It's the movie, but one, The Lost Village. That's actually a great phrase for the world. This village that we live in is lost. It was designed to be in connection with God and what being lost ultimately leads to is us blue people experiencing tremendous amounts of fear. And rightly so, we're living out of our God-created design, the, the God who created all things by Christ and for Christ. We don't live in union with him because we're dead in sin creates fear. Paul says this in that passage, that we're following the way and the word of the prince and power of the air. This means we're hitting two topics that um, nobody really likes to talk about much, one being sin, which I've already used that word, and the other one being Satan. People are like, I don't even know if I believe that stuff. Let me just say this real quick. Words really, really, really matter. I read a children's book with my kids and it starts by how God created the world. And it says he created the world with words, strong words, powerful words. And the words in which God was speaking to create the world from nothing, that theologians say ex nihilo, out of absolutely nothing. We make out of existing stuff. We build a room, right? Trees that are already there or colors that we've already seen, whatever these things are. He made out of nothing with words. But the Bible says he didn't just create out of words, but that he upholds the universe right now. The world is held together by God's powerful words. And his words are powerful and strong, but they're also good. But in the world, there is counter words, bad words that aren't just cuss words, right? The bad word of the enemy, this is real. So even if you're in this room and you go, I don't even know if I believe that. You have moments in your own head where you have thoughts that are affirming, but way more often than not, you have thoughts that are destructive. And many of us battle, like why do I continually wrap my head around bad things? There are bad words being spoken through the world in our flesh and because ultimately of the devil. And Paul says we were following the prince and power of the air. Now remember, the prince and power of the air was a deceiver from the beginning. He tells lies, he promises us things 
are true and that they're good that in fact are never good and can never be delivered upon. And the, the crazy part is he's very deceptive. He doesn't come like Sparky, right? He doesn't come like Sparky. He comes in our thoughts. He comes through the words of other people. He comes through advertisements. He comes through all kinds of different means. But he's deceptive and he's a liar and a deceiver and one who's out to seek, to kill, and to destroy. This whole section is about our solidarity and sin leads to death. And now we're going to see that in Christ, when we find solidarity in Christ, we find life. But we wave the palm branches of Palm Sunday looking for a deliverer because this is true about the world. The thing I love about the Bible is it's ruthlessly realistic. I can walk right now to any bookstore, get on Amazon, and get a lot of books that are helpful. I'm not saying they're not helpful. Like you could call them self-help books or you could call them, like they're, they're, they're helpful to a level, but they're naively optimistic. Because the truth of the matter is they communicate things and neglect the fact that life is really, really, really hard. And people do awful, awful, awful things. And we feel really, really, really lonely. And insanely anxious. So anxious that many of us struggle to even get in the room today. So depressed that many people that aren't here couldn't even get out of bed. But the Bible's ruthlessly realistic. It speaks into those realities right here, right now, about you. Specifically about our condition and about the condition of our world. There are marches like crazy because there's hatred and division in the world all over the place. Marches are happening because what Paul says at the beginning of chapter 2 is true. The crazy part about what Paul says is he says the problem isn't all out there. It's inside you as well. And yet God has done something. This is where it gets powerful in verse 4. He says, but, there are beautiful buts in the Bible. It's just true. Okay, I'm not even trying to say that. It's true. Like when you're reading and you're seeing all this stuff, like you're reading the beginning of this and you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But, you have to go, but what? But what? But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. All of this is true. The ruthless realism of where God comes right into your neighborhood, into your very thoughts. The word of God, the book of Hebrews says, judges the thoughts and intentions of our heart. It's so sharp. It goes, I'll be so ruthlessly realistic. I know where you're living. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're struggling with. I know what you're longing, even when your words don't express it. The heart cries for your own liberation and for being alive. I know it. All of that's real, but God, because of his great love, this is where this gets fantastic. If you ever look at Jesus, especially in this week where we drive into what the church calls Maundy Thursday, but Good Friday, where you're celebrating this really, really dark moment. The dark moment's there because of how realistic the Bible is about the condition of the world and the condition of your heart and my heart without Christ. If you ever go, why did God continue on to this path where in many Good Friday services you'll get nails and they're celebrating blood and they're celebrating an absolute murdered body? Like, it feels all weird. Why did God do it? Because of his great love, not a general love for us, a specific love. That word great is heavy. It means weighty. It isn't like a hallmark, you know, there's a red card or a pink card with a heart on it and a fancy phrase there. It's not trite love. It's strong, powerful, great love. But because of his great love, for us. I would submit to you that every person that takes a palm branch seeking liberation, that's just a big word for freedom, really asking to be made alive in the deepest parts of who they are, are craving love. And here's why. Listen to me on this. Are craving love. Here's why. We're made in the image of God. What's happening here in verse 4 but because of his great love, is God acting out of his very character. 
if you're an executive of any kind um, and where you ever have to hire people, if you manage people or whatever and you hire people, people will do all these personality tests like DISC analysis and Myers-Briggs analysis and they're super helpful. But when you get into the nitty gritty, people will always wanna say, I wanna know what they've done. This is why references are meant to be helpful. The truth is they're not that helpful because people just put on people that they know are gonna say good things about them. But that's why I've always vowed in a reference, I'm gonna tell the truth, right? Because what people will say is if you can ask enough questions about what they've done, past action is the greatest indicator of future performance. Now you gotta understand something, I believe the Bible, I believe people can change, but that's just true. And here's why, people act out of who they really are. We always want people to judge us based upon what we aspire to be. The problem is when push comes to shove in a business setting or a hiring setting is, I need to know who you really are. Because we act out of who we are, that's what Jesus says, that it's out of the heart that come murder, theft, adultery or out of the pure in heart, because of what God's done, acts of righteousness and justice and goodness and love can come by God. Well, this is God acting out of his character. Because of his great love for us, he acts out of love because 1 John 4 says God is love. Now he begins to color it for us. He says God, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. I love this too, as we begin to look at who is God. God's rich in mercy, in a world that operates on are you deserving or are you not? God's ruthlessly realistic and he goes, I know you're not, but I still come and give. I still give you that which you don't deserve. And in fact, I don't give you what you do deserve. He's rich, this word literally means opulent or gaudy mercy. If you don't know what gaudy is, most of you do. I love a lot of Scottsdale, but not all of Scott. There's certain moments when you're walking around and somebody drives up and they get out and they're wearing something or a wife's wearing something and they're wearing all of the jewels. Here's a slang term for you who aren't up on slang. They have bling. They're blinged out, right? Stuff shining, moving, going. And you look at that and you're like, that's gaudy or that car's very opulent, or the new home that they moved in, that's really opulent, they must be rich. My boys play baseball, and now 10-year-olds actually think that they should be big leaguers who have walk-up songs. So the parents will you know, get these big speakers, and they're connected to Bluetooth, so you can like sit away if you're a parent, like, I don't even wanna be seen, but you're like sitting there acting like you're on the phone, and then they, they push a song. And there's this song called Rolex that I, I heard through this. Anybody heard it? Shame on you. <laughs> so it's not a song that I would advocate, but it's basically this guy saying, I want, and he calls a Rolex a Roly. I want a Roly, Roly, Roly. And then he has this line where he says, I want some ice on my wrist. And you're like, why does he want ice on his wrist? Ice is slang for like diamonds, pizzazz, opulence. And he says, I just want some ice on my wrist so I look better when I dance, right? That's why I want a Roly. You're gonna see my opulence to see me. I'm gonna look good dancing and you're gonna be like, he's rich. God's blinged out, but he's blinged out with love and with mercy. And he doesn't wear it externally. It's who he is at his very core. God doesn't just act in love. He doesn't just act in mercy. He doesn't just act in grace. He is love. So therefore he can't but intervene because of his great love, not generally cast over creation, but directly at creation, in fact, directly at you and I, if we've received this love by faith. God's blinged out, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. Now look at what he says. Because of his rich in mercy, he made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace you've been saved. Now this is when love doesn't just get like, oh wow, that feels great. He loves. You begin to understand that true love of any kind, hear this, this is worth writing down, not because I'm smart, because it's true. True love of any kind is costly love. Love that's really love 
costs something. It's sacrificial love. It's dirt under your fingernails and blood on your brow type love. It's self-sacrificing love. The reason we'd go, why does he do this? Because of his great love for us. It's the greatest of motherly love. And the profound nature of the courage of a father's love and the sacrifice of a mother's love. It's that kind of love. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sins. It's not a are you deserving love. It's not that God steps back and goes, hey, you know what? When you finally get it together, then we can talk. When you finally clean yourself up, because I don't like the stench, I don't like the smell, I don't like your look. Remember what he said, it's dead. It's like walk into the morgue, go into the grave, in the midst of all of the stench, in the midst of all of the horror, in the midst of all of the anguish of a dead face, and it's like, I'm coming in the midst of your death to breathe into you life. At massive, massive, massive cost to ourselves. Even, even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins. Paul says it, the same thing in Romans chapter five, verse eight, when he says this. But God demonstrates, God's a demonstrator, he's a displayer, his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We don't live in a world that goes, oh, they're a total screw up. Bless them. That's not how it works. I came across in the last year this amazing uh, statement about the parable of the prodigal son. So this son who just wants to use his father and take his stuff and then leave and he squanders it all and he's like, I got nothing left. I'd be better to eat with the pigs in my father's house than not. And he begins to walk back. And if any of you have ever this story, Jesus tells this story. He begins to walk himself back and his head's down. He's like, I just hope my father lets me in to eat with the pigs because I have more there. I've screwed up my whole life. I've squandered my whole entire life. It says the father sees him at a distance, totally shames himself, sprints to the son, lavishes blessing upon him, lavishes blessing, party, everything he has. I mean, it's far from the pigs. He's got more than he's ever had in the world. And this guy said this, love this phrase. He said, in the world, if you fail at marriage, divorce. If you fail at your job, you're fired. If you fail at God, he throws a party. Folks, that's the gospel. The gospel is we can't keep it together. We can't get ourselves to where God goes, look at them. They're amazing. Look at how good they are. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He then moves on, verse nine. Sorry, I said verse nine. Actually, this would be verse six, I think, in Ephesians chapter two. So in Ephesians chapter two, and God raised us with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. I may have screwed this up. What does verse five say? You guys can laugh. I'm a human. Made us alive together in Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. Let me stop here before we get at grace, because this is really, really important. There are tons of us in this room that fundamentally one of our deepest, deepest challenges in life is that we can have it roll off of our tongue that we trust God, that we have faith in God. But the truth is we struggle like crazy with trust. We struggle like crazy with belief. Is he really for me? We struggle like crazy with faith. This is why it's so powerful when Jesus has this moment with the man in the Gospels and he says, do you believe? And the man says this line that every person in this room that says they believe should say, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. We struggle with this. Here's what I want to tell you because this is all about the character of God. God is trustworthy. Even when you don't feel it, God is faithful even when you don't feel like he's faithful. God is near 
even when everything within you goes, he's so far away. I haven't heard from him in so long. My life is darkness. How in the world could he be light? In the midst of your debilitating anxiety, in the midst of your I can't move depression, in the midst of your the world has collapsed and is hell on earth at the loss of a child or the loss of a spouse, in the midst of the horrors of your confusion, does God even exist? God exists, he's trustworthy, and he's closer to you than the nose that's actually on your face. He will never leave you or forsake you. Here's what that means for us. That means even in our moments of doubt, we have to doubt our doubts and believe our beliefs. You have to doubt, why do you trust in your doubts? At the moment, we profess, we believe this, and we continue to say it. Martin Lloyd-Jones is one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century, people would say. Pastored his congregation through the London bombings in World War II. Wrote a book called Spiritual Depression. You want to know why? He was depressed, as were so many other people. So if you ever sit in here in the midst of your anxiety, in the midst of your depression, in the midst of your grief, in the midst of your confusion, in the midst of your doubts, and you go, maybe I don't just measure up. Welcome to the hall of fame of faith of the saints who struggled with the same things. The difference was what Martin Lloyd-Jones says in that book is our biggest problem in life, one of our primary problems in life is we spend way more time listening to ourselves than we do talking to ourselves. And tell me this isn't true. We make meaning of a significant relationship. You walk home, your spouse doesn't do something, and you presume, well, they must think this. They must do this. They must go there. And then it breeds anxiety, and now you're anxious that you're anxious. Or whatever's happening in your life, you're depressed, and then you think about being depressed, then you wrap your head around depression, you listen to yourself, now you're depressed that you're depressed. You're sad that you're sad. At some point, we have to enter in and preach this. God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. He did it. God's character's true. God meets me in the pain. God sacrificed himself to meet us here. God is the sure foundation. The historic hymns of the faith. How firm a foundation, you, ye saints of the Lord, is held by God in his excellent word, his word that upholds the universe, his word that's sharper than any two-edged sword, that pierces to the division of bone and marrow, that judges the thoughts and intentions of your heart and that says to you, I'm with you and I love you. And as we said some week back, he doesn't just love you folks, he likes you. In Christ, he likes you. He quiets you with his love. That's truth. That's what we must preach to ourselves. He's trustworthy, he's good, and he's powerful. Those are facts. It's not fiction. It's not opinion. That's truth. And it's by grace you've been saved. The way in which God operates in the world, when the world has fallen into sin, he doesn't operate by saying, I pretty much fix it, but you have a lot of stuff you gotta do too. There's all kinds of us in this room and all kinds of other people that will use this language like, I made a decision for Christ. You made nothing, right? God intervened. If we love God, we love God because he first loved us. If we love God, it's because he opened our eyes. The reality of being dead is dead people don't see and dead people don't breathe and dead people don't make a decision. God got into the midst of the morgue amongst all kinds of people, red, yellow, black and white, Democrat, Republican, even independent, right? Or whatever new party is out there. All of these kinds of people that in the end go, I'm waving palm branches, we have need. He moves into the morgue amongst us all and we have life because he breathed life into us by the power of the Holy Spirit, because of the power of his resurrection that we're gonna celebrate on Sunday. It has nothing to do, nothing to do with what we've done. That action, nothing. Now there are demands upon God's action to us, which we're gonna talk about the Sunday after Easter. But it's by grace you've been saved, which is the best news. It's the goodness of the good news. That there is a deliverer, 
that the palm branches bring about, so they actually celebrate a reality. There is a reason to say hooray, Hosanna. There is one who's blessed, who's come in the name of the Lord, and it is the one who came in on a donkey, not riding with a military battalion. He came in on a donkey, on a humble donkey, riding on a horse, and they were saying, he's the one and he is the one who conquered the power of Satan's sin and death by dying on a cross. Here's what that means for us as the church. That means if this is an all of us thing, there's not a person in this room, if you believe this, who can look down your nose at anybody, ever. Doesn't mean don't have wisdom, but Jesus said this, you who say you fool, the word he says is raka, are subject to the hellfire. How can he say that? If we look and go, you fool, he's saying, if you say that, you don't truly believe this. And believing this is our only hope. We can't ever be a people who look down our noses. But here's the other thing, is when you're honest with yourself and when we're honest with ourselves, the truth is Redemption Church is not great. <laughs> it's not. And the truth is I'm not great. And the truth is, I can't fix my stuff and Redemption Church can't fix your stuff no matter how many ministries that we do. And the truer truth is, you can't fix yourself. The truer truth is, we need a deliverer. The good news is that the deliverer has come and his name's Jesus. Now, hear me on this because this point's really important. That word saved there is what they'd call is a perfect tense. That means virtually nothing on its own. But when you understand what it means, it means everything. That word saved means there's something that happened in history, a past real action that has ongoing, present reality. The way in which the Bible talks about salvation isn't this moment of, I have been saved, period. Paul actually says this to the Corinthians. Christ, in whom you have been saved, now listen to this, are being saved and will be saved. Now that's a past action, that it's fact. If by faith you've been saved, you're saved. But tell me this isn't true, Christians, and somebody can give me an amen to this. Many of us put our faith in Christ decades ago, but you're living in a circumstance right now that you need salvation in. Can I get an amen? He's the savior then, just as he was then. He's not the savior once and now you're left to do it all on your own. He's the one we plead for help now. Sin's all around us, sin still remains within us and we need help now, God. I don't need past, I need something that happened in the past that affects me today, right now. I need to, to bring out, I need it to be actualized, activated, lived upon. That's the grace that saved us, is one that saved us, is saving us, and when we stand before the holiness of God, will save us again. The fact that we'll be saved again or being saved right now doesn't mean we're not saved. It's the reality that we are saved. And more than that, it's not the reality of just the action, it's the reality of God. God in his very character is a savior. Amen? We don't serve a God that's trying to squash us. We have a God that's continually trying to save us. That's the good news. The good news is bound up in who God is and the very character of who God is. Now, here's what all that means and what God has done and is doing. He made us alive with Christ. If you by faith are no longer dead in your sins, don't forget that for a minute. Even though you struggle with sin, the reality is, Paul would say, why are you still living like you're dead? You're alive. You're alive. And then he says this in verse six. It is by grace you've been saved through faith. And then he says, verse six, and God raised us up with Christ. So this is the image ultimately of baptism, that we have been buried with Christ in baptism and being raised again to newness of life. He got into the morgue, entered into our death with us in his sacrifice, and he raised us with him, up with Christ Jesus, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now, where does Jesus sit in the heavenly realms in relation to the Father? Now, let me stop and say this. When I ask a question like this, if you don't know the Bible, 
I don't care, neither did I. People ask questions like this all the time and I'd feel stupid, like I don't, I don't have any idea, right? These are moments where you can learn. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now this means if by faith we're in Christ, we've been raised with Christ in his resurrection and joined him in his ascension and are sitting with Christ in the heavenly realms at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places with his authority. And then he says this, the last verse in verse seven, in order that, now there's a reason, right? He did it because of his love, but the destination is in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now leave that right there. We've been raised with Christ by the faith that God granted us. It's all by grace that right now I can say, you're alive in Christ. Now that hasn't been fully realized. It's not like I'm actually there. I'm still living in this death work. But knowing I've been saved and I've been raised, I'm saved and I'm being raised and I will be saved and be raised. That's the logic of the Bible, okay? That means if you look at the right hand of the Father in Christ, there are people of all times, people of all places, people of all ethnicities, people who had different economic standing, some who died peacefully, others who were martyred. There are people there who could never hear. There are those who could never speak and those who were the most eloquent speakers. But they're all there by God's grace because of his rich mercy, because of his great love. We're sitting in the midst of, of being with Christ at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. Why? Okay. Now this is great, because everybody at this point watches this. This is the thing that First Peter says that angels long to look into. This is the thing that we'll see later in Ephesians, that the principalities and power, Satan himself, are blown away at the manifold wisdom of God that's expressed in the multicolored nature of the church beyond ethnicity, but certainly including ethnicity. And that everybody looks upon it and goes, them? What? Like, them? And they are going, God, God surely did choose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. <laughs> them? That's the crew? That's the group? that what would then be on display is not the ice on God's wrist, right? but that people would go, he's rich, but he's rich in mercy. He's rich in kindness. In fact, Paul says, the very thing that led the people to that place, their faith and repentance. Paul says, do you know what leads us to repentance, folks? It's not that you were so enlightened and that you got it. It wasn't that at some moment you had the spiritual epiphany. Do you not know it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance? Folks, if we believe, it's because God has been so kind to us. And then he tells us, and we're gonna see this in a couple weeks, if that's true of what God's done to you, and you have people in your life that you so bad want to get it, you want them to repent, God forbid you be the person that's standing in front of them in, in judgment upon them. Lead them to repentance through your love, mercy, and kindness. That's the character of God. That is the character of God. And it's massively compelling. I'll tell you this, not everybody. There's a big word called centripetal. Most people know centrifugal because Shania Twain sung this song about centrifugal force. But centripetal is moth to a flame. Let me tell you this. I've said this before up here, but I'm gonna say it again. I grew up in a family that, I was thinking about this this week, they're in town. Um, I did this last time about my dad, but I, I'm convinced this family dynamic shows so much of the, the, the grace of God um, when God does it well. But we had a family where we would consistently say, all of our friends wanted to be at our house. Non-Christian family, by the way. We didn't, we were not following Jesus but everybody would want to be at our house. My sister's friends would want to be there, my friends would be there, people are sleeping over all the time, and they always wanted to come there. 
Well, now I'm taking a walk with my mom when I was home in Denver, and she said, your dad and I talk all the time about why you kids, your sister and the grandkids, want to be at the house all the time. Like, why, does it, why do you guys want to be? Because here's what I know personally as a son. It ain't because it's perfect. And it ain't because there was never any yelling or, you know, chairs pushed across when you're, on, you know, downstairs and you hear the chairs pushed across and people yelling or that it always felt great. It wasn't because of that. The reason we want to be there is because it is a place abounding in love, rich in mercy, and grace all over the place. I knew I could screw up bad, and that was still the place. And the kids feel it. Our friends felt it. It was centripetal. It was like a moth to a flame. That is who God is. So if you're sitting right now going, is it worth it? This moment of Jesus looking over Jerusalem, weeping, going, how I long to gather you as a hen would gather her chicks and protect them. I am the one you're waving palm branches for. Folks, he's worth it. You gotta see him for who he truly is. And then we have to know as a church, God has called us to be his body and represent that. Which I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. We're gonna get there. That's the power of the love of God. God who is rich in mercy, great in love, at massive cost to himself that while we were yet dead in our sins, made us alive. Amen? It's one of the reasons I love every week um, at Redemption, we celebrate the Lord's Supper in communion. I'm gonna invite right now uh, all of those who are serving to come forward and to walk down the aisles. I'm gonna ask all of you to wait and hold the elements because we're gonna take it together. Um, This moment was instituted much more at a dinner setting and they would have been partaking of a common loaf and a common cup that they would drink from. But this is a moment fundamentally of where we're taking the nearness of God. He says, my body, this is my body, and this is my blood. And it's God's offering of himself to those who by faith receive. The church is a participating church, and we're gonna participate together right now in communion. Here's what I ask of you. One simple thing. The images of this moment are so many. But right now, here's what I want the image of you to be. As I pray that God would unleash his heart, this is the moment a father is communicating to his child. When you're kind of uncertain, you're kind of unsure, and the father just comes, wraps his arm, and just gives you a kiss on the head and says, I love you. Folks, hear me on this. This is not meant to be corny. This is the truth of the Bible. This is the God of the universe who spoke it into existence through powerful words, communicating his corporate love to us as a people, but his individual love for you, and he's assuring us, I have and will fix all of this. Now, if you're in here and you go, I don't believe any of this, it would be nuts by your own profession for you to take this moment. But if you're in here and you go, I don't know, God's talking to me, this absolutely can be a moment where you first receive God's grace and go, I just, I want God. I don't know what it all means. I want that love. I want that richness of mercy and partake of this moment. Hold on to the elements. I'm gonna come back up. We're gonna take it together and then we're gonna spend some time singing at the end. Father, be with us, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would in power reveal yourself to us right now. Let your Holy Spirit communicate your love in Christ's name.